Hey peeps, welcome back to my channel. Today, my husband is joining me. Hello. <laughs> we are going to be doing a series of videos about disability because we both have our own disabilities. And today we're going to do a brief introduction as to what those disabilities are. Then we're going to talk a little bit about how we've had to adapt our lives to handle them. Uh, our next videos that we do on this will go over ways to make it easier when you're disabled. We'll talk about the, the specifics of our disabilities. We'll talk about what not to say to disabled people and ways to make it easier for your friends who are disabled. So why don't we get started here? Um, Sam, will you tell me a little bit and tell my readers a bit about your disabilities? Um, basically, I have three disabilities. One, the first disability is something obvious. It is the way I speak and the way I move. 20 years ago, I was diagnosed with ALS and people who are diagnosed with this die within three to five years after being diagnosed and obviously I am not dead. Um, I am still independent. I am able to move around and function. I do have some issues. Um, I have a hard time walking, balancing, and of course, I have a hard time speaking, but I am still functional. My second disability, I was diagnosed with type one diabetes almost 30 years ago. This is a huge one because I am physically dependent on insulin. Um, I have to take this for the rest of my life to stay alive. And I take it four times a day sometimes five or six times a day. Um, and my third disability isn't the obvious. It came about three years ago. It is chronic back pain. I have a hard time moving around and it is also difficult for me to sleep. And of course, I have a lot of ongoing pain. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my disabilities. Um, and then Sam and I will talk a bit about how this has affected our lives over the years. I have something called MCAS, Mast Cell Activation Disorder um, or Syndrome. It's basically my body thinks everything's trying to kill it and I have allergic reactions to so many things. Um, I'm very histamine sensitive, even being out in the sun for a little too long, which is more than just a couple minutes, can trigger a reaction. A lot of foods can trigger reactions. Stress can trigger reactions. Uh, the smell of garlic will send me into a reaction. Um, this I've probably had since childhood, because I've always had, even on me. Yeah, even the smell of garlic on Sam yeah. can send me into a reaction. So I've probably had this since childhood. Uh, food allergies and mast cell disorders seem to run in our family. My mother was food anal food allergy anaphylactic. Um, one of my sisters is anaphylactic to a number of foods. My niece has mastocytosis. One of her daughters just got diagnosed with MCAS. I have MCAS. I have also food allergies, which are a slightly different thing. Um, my other disability, 
it's not been diagnosed per se, but it is a disability. I, in 1994, I fell on a parking lot, stepped into a pothole I didn't see, um, basically fractured my ankle, but they didn't know it at the hospital. And I tore all the tendons and ligaments. It was so swollen, they couldn't see the fracture. The next day I got a call saying, you should go get a cast on. We had no insurance. We had no money for a cast. And none of the doctors would do it without money up front. So I spent a year on crutches and it totally screwed up my back and hips. And I've had back issues ever since. Uh, I get a lot of chronic back pain um, and it, uh, it interferes with life in a number of ways. I've been working through it, but I don't think the damage will ever be fully repaired. So those are what I would consider my disabilities. Um, I also have type two diabetes and they, my doctor thinks that came on as part of the mast cell disorder when that became full blown because mast cell activation syndrome can be connected with type two diabetes, thyroid issues, adrenal issues, so many issues, they're all interwoven and they create like this stew of problems in your body. So yeah, it's, it's been challenging over the years. Um, when we were first together, when we first met, both of us were fully able. I had some food issues I didn't realize then was the MCAS and was the histamine issues. I didn't have type 1 diabetes. No, the diabetes came on um, about three, we got together in October 1992 and January 20th, there was a big storm here called the President's Day Storm. And it was right after my birthday and Sam needed to get his license um, renewed. So my friend was taking us out to do that, but we ended up at the hospital because Sam had been having stomach cramps and a lot of pain and tremendous thirst. And the stomach cramps were so bad that day that we ended up at the hospital. That's when we found out he had type one diabetes. That was kind of a shock, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, we were really nerve wracked. Neither one of us had dealt with diabetes before. Um, do you remember how, what you were thinking at that point? Or? Um, my first reaction was, I'll be dead in a few years. Yeah, I think back then, because we didn't know much about it, we didn't realize that you can manage it you know, that it can be managed. I knew it could be managed. I just, I knew also that people who had type 1 diabetes often accumulated damage like neuropathy, blindness, kidney failure, strokes, everything. That's true. Actually, type 2 diabetes can do that, too. The leading cause of blindness in the United States is diabetes. What? Let's talk a little bit about how that started to impact your life. The first thing I had to deal with was money. I had no money no health insurance, anything, and a bottle of insulin nowadays costs um, $300 a bottle on the open market. Right now, I go through two bottles every three months. And we were a lot poorer back then, too. We were barely making ends meet. Um, a friend helped us out, and then we found out, because Sam is a veteran, the VA covers his insulin costs, and 
test kit costs. And also back then there was Medicaid, but I didn't know about it. But um, so actually, because of the health system in this country, we found out we could get help for his hospital bills if we got married early. We had already planned on getting married. So we legally got married in February that year to help to help with the medical costs. And then we had our wedding on May 1st, which is our, we consider our wedding anniversary. But to, to actually help pay the hospital, we ended up having to get married early. Um, because neither one of us had insurance. I was reading tarot cards for a living and Sam was working at a restaurant. And most part-time jobs like that, you don't get health insurance. Over the years, he managed to learn to manage it, but we came into a spot where it began to affect me when he started having low blood sugar seizures. That was a difficult time period because the first time it happened, I woke up and he was in seizure in bed next to me. And I, I didn't know what it was, but somehow I knew how to deal with it. It was like an instinct that just just was there. And the only thing we had in the house with sugar in it at that point was Sprite. So I grabbed the Sprite and I managed to get him in a sitting up position, poured some in his mouth. Then I called 911 and the medics came out and they were like, oh, it's a low blood sugar seizure. You did basically the right thing by getting sugar into him. And I was like, well, what happens if it happens again? Do I call you again? No, just, you know, pull him out of it. And I was like, oh, my back issues started in 94. We went to Safeway at one in the morning. I don't remember what we were going to buy. We wanted some junk food, I think. And yeah. <laughs> we got there and we parked out in the parking lot in a dimly lighted area. Now, they should have had more light there, honestly, because if they expect their patrons to utilize certain areas of the parking lot, it should be lit so you can see. It wasn't. There was a pothole underneath the car that I didn't see. So I opened the door, stepped out, thought I was on the ground. I guess just part of my foot must have been. And when I stood up and put all my weight on it, it knocked me over because my foot slipped into the pothole and I fell. And when I fell, I tore up my ankle um, really bad. We had to go to the emergency room. And as I said earlier, you know, they couldn't see the fracture then. So I spent a year on crutches. I, in retrospect, I would do anything to get that money to get that cast at this point if I had to do over again because it would have healed up and it wouldn't have left me with chronic back issues. But I didn't like asking for help back then. I didn't want to ask anybody for money and we didn't have that many people we could have asked anyway. And I see a chiropractor to keep myself functional. Um, It helps a lot, but there's not much I can do for it because it's just a lot of scar tissue in there. Um, So yeah, you know, by 1998, when he started having the blood sugar seizures, my back was messed up. And then Sam started having other symptoms that year. I started having clonus. That is over... C-L-O-N-U-S. You can web search on that term. That is where your muscles and nervous system is spastic. I started having trouble walking. And I didn't know what was going on. I was still lifting weights really hard. I finally went to a neurologist and he diagnosed me with ALS and that was 
I knew it was a bit a bad diagnosis. I knew people died within a few years of it. So I thought, great, I'll be dead within a few years. Uh, the first things we did was I signed a living will. I did not want to be kept alive with a respirator or if I wasn't independent. I do not want to put my wife through that. That was a very, very bad year. Um, that was yeah. the year 19, or 2000. We had just moved up. Yeah. Sam had gotten a job in high tech up here. And then the dot-com fall-off ha happened. Now, I've told this story a bit, but I've never told it in depth in terms of, like, the diagnosis and stuff. Um, Sam got diagnosed with ALS, and I think it was, I think it was November. Yeah, it was November that year. Then he lost his job. December. December it, is the bad year for yeah, going to the doctor. The very first diagnosis came in December and then, or it came in November and then you lost your job. My mother was dying of cancer at that time. In December, three days before she died, Sam was told, well, maybe it's not ALS. We're not sure. Um, at that point, they had kind of retracted it. Three days later, my mother died. And the week after that, I got a book contract, but they wanted the book in six weeks. And we needed the money. So I had to write the book, even though I was dealing with, you know, reeling from thinking Sam was going to die. My mother had just died. It was a horrendous time. We got very superstitious about December because a lot of things happened in December's after that. <laughs> in fact, we tend not to go to the doctor in December if we don't have to. Yeah. It's, it's just that, yeah, we don't. My father died in December. Yeah. Your aunt, your stepmom, she died in December. Yeah. And my stepdad died in December. That was another yeah. issue. But, but all four of our parents basically died. And the month of December, while we were together, Sam was diagnosed twice with ALS in the month of December. The second time came 2004. And it, it was just, December is, we try to make the month of December as bright and cheery as possible because there's a lot of baggage with it. So Sam was diagnosed you know, with ALS, and then they said it might not be, and then they went through a massive number of tests trying to figure out what the hell it was. They tried to diagnose him with stiff man syndrome. I have been on the web looking all these things up. There are so many weird freaking conditions that can happen to the body, just bizarre conditions. It kind of shell-shocked me, but... Um, they tried to say it was stiff man syndrome. Then there was something else. And there was PLS. PLS. Hyperspasticity. Do you remember any of the other diagnoses? No. Yeah, what they tried. Parkinson's. To, yeah, Parkinson's, MS. Um, they did spinal taps on him. They did MRIs. They did... Um, Magnetic resonance test. I remember they did that. And a number of other things. And e -M -I, um, e -M um, electromuscular conductivity. Activity. Yeah. And what they came up with was, well, you have a neuron disease, a motor neuron disease. They finally said it was absolutely ALS. That came in 2004. Um, and that's the diagnosis he's had since then, is ALS. That year, 
when he came home with the diagnosis again, we spent about six months just freaking out. Actually, I think it was more like six weeks. I couldn't take six months of that. And then I decided that he didn't quite fit the symptoms. So there had to be something else going on, at least underlying. I did a tremendous amount of searching on the web for people who were diagnosed with ALS who either their symptoms had stopped or they had been misdiagnosed or it just they had managed to live. And I looked at what they had done. So we got him into acupuncture and I got him onto some supplements and I got him onto a number of different things. And that seemed to pull the symptoms back to some degree. I stopped progressing. And he stopped drinking aspartame. He had been drinking a lot of aspartame in his coffee from the time he was diagnosed with diabetes. And it can cause neurological um neurological impairment in some people so he stopped that and the symptoms pulled back a little bit he stopped progressing and he's pretty much i mean what would you say from 2004 until now how much have you progressed i have not progressed at all i have increased my muscularity a little since then. Um, back in February of this year, I did a DXA scan to measure my body fat percentage, and they put all the numbers into an FFMI calculator. I came up with an adjusted score of 24.5, which is, puts me in the upper 2% of the population in terms of physical fitness. I lift a lot of weights, and I am very active in my workouts. Yeah, I'm glad we, we bought a home gym this past this year. I'm so glad we did because of the pandemic. You can still yeah. lift. I mean, it's not quite as robust of a system as you get at the gym, but at least yeah. you can still lift weights. And it helps your diabetes. Yeah. That's one thing he a does lot. for his diabetes. And I do an all machine workout at the gym. Because for me, weights, that is completely out of the question. One thing I've noticed is when I lift weights, my stabilizer muscles are very shaky. My, my strength muscles just pushing or pulling, that is almost fine. So I need machines to stabilize my movements but once i have that i can lift pretty hard and my lung capacity is really good i do not smoke yeah we don't allow cigarettes in the house i'm severely allergic to the smoke and we just don't like it um so that I do use vape. Yeah, it helps me sleep at night. If I do not move around that much, my muscles will start to twitch and just cramp up. So if I sit in my chair, I need to get up every so often and move around and just shake myself out when i sleep i am still and i will cramp up a lot um about five years ago this was really bad i started um medication mixilatine to help alleviate cramping 
back left hand to help with it. And another thing is THC in Washington State cannabis, recreational cannabis is legal. So I got a vape pen with a high concentration of THC, a CBD, and I take this every night. Not a lot, just enough to help relax my muscles. And it works a lot. So that's about where Sam's at at this point. Um, the back pain, they told him, it's a sign of age for one thing, because we're both in our 50s. I'm 59, Sam is, oh, 54? 54, I'll be 55 soon. Yeah, so with age does come some issues. Unfortunately, I, I hear the cats running through the hall. <laughs> Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's it's really narrowed my life in terms of what I can do now because of the histamine issues and food. Um, I have to smell the meat <laughs> before we cook. In fact, one of the most oddest common phrases in our house is Yasmin, come smell the meat. And no, it's not a euphemism. Not this time. Hello, Kaylee. Uh, when you have histamine intolerance or also activation disorder or mastocytosis like my niece, some of us who have that have a heightened sense of smell for when things are too old for us. There is a, excuse me, Kaylee. There is a um, chemical in meat called cadaverine and as the histamine levels rise, so does the cadaverine level. And that's what I'm smelling. And it will smell almost like vinegar. There's this pungent smell. So I have to smell every piece of meat before it's cooked. I can't eat leftovers. I can't eat fish. I can't eat citrus. I can't eat nuts. I'm allergic to dairy, so I can't eat dairy. I can't eat anything fermented. I can't eat tomatoes. I can't eat eggplant. The list goes on and on. Um, as I said, I think- I'm that, a type one diabetic and I'm a lot more versatile with eating than Yasmin is. Yeah. And sometimes I really envy that. Not the type one diabetes, but the versatility. Thank you. Um, I've got type 2. That's enough to deal with. And then I have to stay as low carb as I can because of the type 2 diabetes. But a low carb diet conflicts with a low histamine diet. So I'm walking a tightrope constantly. And when I have a reaction, I have to take Benadryl to keep it from going potentially into anaphylaxis. So I buy Benadryl in bulk and I take it a lot. I had... The, yesterday, I just sat down and I wrote up every supplement that I have to take. And the list is like 20 some supplements long every day. Um, I hate taking pills, which makes it hard. But I try to get those into myself because it makes a difference in how stable my mast cells are. I'm also on a medication called low dose naltrox, naltroxine. You might know it by the generic term Narcan, which is used for addicts. It's to help um, drug addicts come off of opiates. In fact, it prevents opiates from actually affecting your body. However, in very low doses, it acts as an anti-inflammatory and as a mast cell stabilizer. So I take considering you cannot take anti-inflammatories anyway. That's right. This helps a lot. I cannot take 
any NSAIDs. I cannot take ibuprofen. I cannot take Aleve. I cannot take aspirin. Um, Tylenol, I don't take because it has liver issues that can happen. And also it doesn't do any good for me. Tylenol has never helped me. So I just don't bother with it. Codeine um, or both? I, I can handle codeine, but you, A, it's hard to get, and B, I don't want to be on that on a long-term basis. It's and effective. Physically addictive. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Now, THC, pot, it's supposed to help mast cells, but with my asthma, I can't take it that often. I have to be very careful what I put in my lungs. I don't take edibles because you can't control the dosage. I used to be a party girl. When I was a teenager and early 20s, I probably smoked and ate more pot than I did food. But I need my mind to be clear in my writing. I just don't have the time to be stoned all the time. The MCAS, I probably had since childhood. I had food allergies when I was a kid. My stepfather thought it was all in my mind and kept telling me it was all in my mind and kept feeding me foods I was allergic to, which probably destabilized my body even more. As I grew up, I grew up eating the foods I shouldn't eat because of that and not believing myself when I would have issues. It's caused a lot of emotional um, a fear over not being believed about when I don't feel good or when I'm having a reaction. It's also caused a lot of questioning myself. Am I really exaggerating this? Is this real? Is this ha happening? One thing I do a lot of um, being her spouse, being your spouse, is I reaffirm it isn't in your mind, and I know firsthand it isn't in her mind because I see it physically. Yeah, and he sees the hives. At night, my worst reactions, he has to help because I get... <clears throat> everybody with MCAS will have different sorts of reactions. If I have one in the middle of the night... I end up shaking for a couple hours and I will spiral into panic attacks and sometimes itching will come with that intense itching. And if I'm spiraling really quick into the reaction, I have to wake him up so he can help me because sometimes I can't even take my Benadryl. I know I need it. I know it's there. I can't somehow bring myself or, or connect the idea of, I need Benadryl with actually taking the Benadryl. So sometimes he has to get up out of bed and get my Benadryl for me. And that can cause issues because when he gets up, his back hurts. So it it's problematic sometimes for us. And I move slow. So we keep Benadryl on the nightstand. And he knows the pattern of what to do. And he knows how to use my EpiPen if I need it. Um, luckily I haven't had to so far, but we keep up to date because you never can tell when it's going to have to happen. Uh, the MCAS came on full blown in about 2016 it started, or no, it started a bit before then. And it started around the time when I left Berkeley and went indie because the stress was tremendous. And the stress and the worry of, am I going to make this work? Can I make this work? Um, Sam wasn't working at that time, so, and he was, had run out of an employment. And it had gotten to the point where I was so scared of not being able to make enough money to support us that the stress threw my body into like a shock. And the MCAS came on at that point, and I started having reactions to things I've never had reactions to. I started getting hives when I ate strawberries. I started getting hives when I ate tomatoes. I started getting 
um, reactions that I had no clue what they were to. And I was like, I can't be developing allergies to everything. And then my niece moved up here from Texas. And as I said, she has mastocytosis. And when we started talking, she was like, yeah, I get those too. Yeah, I get that reaction too. And she was like, are you sure you don't have a mast cell disorder? And she's a nurse. So I went to my doctor and I talked to my doctor and we pretty much, we've come to the conclusion I do have MCAS. You know, we've, we've looked at all the symptoms and done what tests we can. And it's like, yeah, I have mast cell activation disorder. Um, and there's no getting away from it. It doesn't just vanish. It can go into remission, but that doesn't mean you can, as I recently found out, that doesn't mean you can eat other foods and stuff that you couldn't before. Sometimes you can add things back in and everybody is different, but it pretty much just means you take care of yourself to the point of where you can put it into a remission so you're not having continual reactions. I'm in a flare right now. I'm getting reactions night after night and that means I have to go on a very strict low histamine diet. And I need to find other ways to calm the stress down, stay out of the sunlight. I'm looking forward to when autumn comes in because the sun and the heat will go away and we'll have the clouds and the rain again. And that helps my body. Um, so that's kind of a picture of where we're at. You know, it's like we have just learned to progress over the years in dealing with our various problems. We have learned and we are still learning how to help each other through these things. And another thing we should point out, we had to make up our own rules. Yes, that's very important. As I've said several times today, MCAS is different for every person. There's no one way to deal with it. We have had to find things that work for us. And sometimes you have to ignore some of the standard advice if it doesn't work. Um, we do not ignore rules because they are inconvenient and it could cause damage. Um, a number of type 1 diabetics ignore the rule of controlling your blood sugar. They will eat anything and they will get damaged. We ignore rules that do not work for us and we make sure the end result works. That is important. And we're supportive of each other. You know, we support each other with Sam. If he needs help, he knows I will help if he asks. I don't automatically jump in there to do things for him. It's hard for me to ask for help, but I make sure I do. That's one thing. We both had to learn that sometimes you have to ask for help. And that's been one of the hardest lessons is to be able to say, I need help with this. Um, I think that's probably enough for today. Next video, I think we can talk about some of the issues we found with both the public in terms of the outside world and doctors with our various disabilities. And then we'll do a video on positive things, how we've made things work for us and stuff. And we'll go from there. So we'll probably do another video in the next two weeks. So come on back to my channel. Sam has a channel too on YouTube where he's done some um, weightlifting videos, short ones. It isn't much. No, but it's there. So yeah, uh, if you have had issues like this, if you are in a relationship where you are with a disabled person or you are both disabled or you are disabled and your partner is able, why don't you, you know, put in the comments, introduce yourself, um, 
you've heard us talk a bit about what we've had to adjust and how we've had to deal with finding new problems and more problems. So, you know, and we, what rules did you have to make for yourself that will work? Thank you for watching. Um, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. I talk a lot about my writing. I talk a lot about my books. Um, I ought to talk about makeup and the cats and all sorts of things. So subscribe if you like. Uh, and we'll see you back next time. Take Bye. Bye-bye.